not just this recording of a particular place, it's or, or documenting for an order. It has this whole other transcendence into art. And so therefore it gives this amazing energy, which obviously you mentioned today. Um, and uh, it's a beautiful person. So enough of me. Okay. <laughs>
history in that country or anything about the cultural heritage, oral work knowledge of um, functional knowledge of the plant uses or uses of different timbers. And so the project I volunteered on was involved documenting a lot of that um, body of knowledge in order to have some, uh, you know, a, a documentation in order to try and keep the, the country protected and. Um, um, he didn't have any documentation on paper that would sort of hold water in court in terms of, you know, trying to keep keep the place intact and keep development or whatever out of that um, zone of the song line that he was responsible for. And so we were initially spending time up there um, being taught by Paddy Rowe all about all the different uses of the plants and um, their names and their characters and we were mapping the vegetation in different areas in about an 80 kilometre stretch of the coast which was his terrain that he was responsible for. Um, he taught us all the stories for the different places that manifest what's happened there in the past and um, and also the stories on a sort of mythological level or a, the belief system of how the actual, they, the people um, believe that creation actually began in Broome. It didn't, people didn't migrate from other countries. Life in, but you know, plant life, animal life and people all came from that place. So it's quite a different worldview to any other perception of the world um, that you would probably normally encounter. And there are stories that narrate the whole creation process and so the Galarabalu people still are holding all those stories and songs that manifest all that knowledge. And in order to try and protect that body of knowledge, old Paddy, he realised that his people are living on an interface now with the Western world and there were going to be a lot more than just his mob living in the place and if he was going to manage to keep the country in good shape and keep that cultural riches, rich, those riches intact, he was going to have to try and educate as many people as he could, be they white fellows or black fellows or visitors internationally. And so he was also concerned about his own family being seduced into town and, you know, by kids being more interested in basketball and videos and drinking and socialising and actually being out in, in the country, keeping their relationship with the place alive. And so he initiated the Lurijari Heritage Trail, which is, at present, it's an annual nine-day walk where the Galarabalu people take a big mob of visitors out bushy with them for nine days. Up to say 50 people they, they post into the country and um, people walk out, of, out start beginning Brown and walk north for 80 kilometres and there's four or five <laughs> traditional camps where people stay that are the same camps that people have always camped in. So they're very much um, they're big midden areas where you see all the, you know, the, the big swathes of shells and charcoal that will tell you that people have camped in that spot above the reef for years and years. And I'm a Victorian, I spent all my childhood down here at Sorrento. My mum um, has had a, a site we camped on as kids and now a house down here. And I was always mystified by the big swathes of shells on the high cliffs of Alcuna and Diamond Bay and these beaches down here. I just couldn't work out how the hell the ocean had ever come up that high and thought, well, it must have been something in the past. But I never really got my head around it. And um, it wasn't until I went to Broome and I was, you know, I was going bush with Paddy and his family and camping in their traditional camps along this Lurijari Trail that I witnessed all these big uh, 
millionaires that we were camping out around ourselves, and and um, they would tell me about you know their grandfathers or, or their people before and the stories of the people they used to live in that camp. And it dawned on me that all the shell remnants and charcoal I was seeing in those clips here, they're actually the traces of people presence. They're not some phenomenon to do with the sea putting them there. They're actually tangible living history in our own context here. But, you know, it's it being, you know, over 50 in my education, it was never a part of my um, school education. I was never never came to that realisation, so it's a bit of an absence of um, what was taught, really. So anyway, um, in the project that Willie document, trying to help Paddy document his cultural heritage up north, it was by, um, by I, was keep, I had a lot of um, interesting plants in the past, and I've always drawn throughout my life. And my friends who were the students stationed up at Beagle Bay and in Broome asked me if I'd come up and help them because they thought I had appropriate skills to help document all the vegetation communities. So I've kept, over 20 years I've kept a lot of diaries, sort of like old explorer's journals with um, scratchy drawings of things and notes to try and help me remember um, a week like because we were often out bush for a week or two and you're trying to keep plant specimens alive for that long to then ID them later. It's um, a bit of a hopeless case. So I was doing lots of drawings and writing down the local names for things and writing down the uses of all the, everything that I was taught about. And those journals have informed you know, a lot of uh, paintings and murals and printmaking that I've done over the years since. Um, a lot of different media. And these particular sequence of boxes, there's six, six boxes in this exhibit. Each one represents one of the six seasons that are observed in brain. Unlike the European calendar, they've got a very particular sensibility for different times of the year. In, on the Kimberley Coast, and there's sort of it might, it's different aspects of the environment that they're living in, um, are aspects of seasonality, whether it's um, the, the, the weather and temperature, or the wind direction, or the presence of particular insects, or the flowering or fruiting of different trees. Um, the migration in of certain birds or whatever from elsewhere. Um, it's also very much about the food sources. So the main focus, if you think about it, when you're living in the bush and you don't can't resort to going to the shop or the supermarket, you have to be very canny for where you find food and water across the year. And you have to formulate some means of teaching your kids and passing on that body of knowledge too. So they also draw links between different phenomena that would happen any one time of year. Uh, for example, um, this, this box in the middle, this is about bargainer season, which is sort of July, which is the coldest time up north. And at, at this time of year, um, all the creek fish are heading up the creek to lay eggs. So you've got, th these are all done from individual drawings. Um, this is a skippy, um, salmon, and uh, queen fish. And they're all fish that live in the mangrove creeks. And so in the winter time, um, those fish are fat, so they're good, they're good eating. Also, so are the mangrove crabs are very good eating at that time of year. Whereas there's other times of the year when, when they're not good eating. So it's also an aspect of a sustainable lifestyle that they only target um, particular food sources at certain times of year and then they smell them and let them replenish and, um, and focus on something else. And also, the way that they perceive 
the, the landscape, they, the people believe that everything that you need has been provided for you since the beginning and, that's, and things come in and out of focus in terms of what's on offer at any one time of year. And it also affects the decisions of where they camp according to where the water is or what food's available. Anyway, so when, when the, to not, the, in order to teach the kids that, you know, at, at cold time, you'll know when the salmon are running because the black pipes are above the, dune, the dunes when the salmon run and they've both got the same wedge-shaped tail. So mm -hmm. they make these mm -hmm. sort of memory links between different things that happen simultaneously. Mm. Also, the, this wombo wattle, uh, when the flowers are fat, the mud crabs are fat. Or, um, no, this box down here is about the season just before the wet season. You've got, it's very cloudy and it's really humid and you're getting big banks up of cloud and lightning and thunder before it actually rains. And those clouds travel across the sea and cast their shadows on the water and also on, on the beach. And at that time of year the green turtles crawl up the beach to lay their eggs but they're protected by the camouflage of the dappled shadows on the, the water and the sand. Um, but at this time of year, the, the freshwater paperbark, the gumball tree flowers, and they say, well, when the gumball flowers, the stingrays are fat, so they head down the beach to spear, spear stingrays in October, November. So there's that plant relationship. The plant is the signal that um, you should look for the stingrays. And also at this time of year, um, the creek fish are now skinny, the reef fish are skinny, there aren't a lot of bush fruits around because it's getting very late in the year and hasn't been water for a while, but all the shellfish are fat. So you have quite a diversity of food sources rather than living on the same food all year. It gets pretty boring too if, you, um, if you're on a similar diet. So yeah, the link, be also the March flies eyes turn green when the power book have the bark flowers and um, the stingrays are fat, so that's another memory aid. This box is about the wet season, once you start getting the rain, um, sort of December to March, April, all the young turtles that have been buried in the sand in the previous month or so, they hatch. I don't know if you saw a documentary that was on last week, did anyone see about all the hatchling turtles and the crops and the sharks <laughs> trying to... I don't know, I said one in 600 makes it. Wow. Yeah, it's incredible. But at this time of year too, um, all the, the migratory shorebirds that come to Broome to feed up across the wet season when the, the tides, tidal extremes are huge, they spend the whole few months on the mud flats there eating up and getting fat before um, April when they migrate to Japan and Russia for, for several months of the year. Um, uh, this time here, because of all the rain, lots of the bush fruits are pumping up. There's quite a big bounty of edible fruits in the bush. Um, yeah, you've still got people um, looking for stingrays, the stingrays are still fat. So it's very much uh, all about the food sources that are available because that's what people's main concern is when, in a traditional lifestyle. Um, it's about not wasting energy on things that you don't need to and knowing where to find food without the least possible expenditure of energy. Uh, so each of these boxes is about one of the six seasonal, well, one of the seasons across the year up north in Broome. Uh, people have asked me how I've actually made these images and they're all composite images. They're all a collage of, there's probably six or eight drawings or paintings in all sorts of media that have gone together to make each image. For example, and a lot of these, these are all different 
um, aspects of artwork that I've done over the last 20 years or so. This little image of the mangrove is, comes from a big mural, murals I did about the seasons that are in a bush park up there that some paints on marine fly. This little figure is a scratchy drawing on paper. Uh, these are paper drawings. This is a liner cut. Um, these are paper drawings. The turtle is done on black scratch paper. I don't know if you've ever used that. It's got a black coating and you scratch it away, it's white underneath. Mm. So it's quite a collect collection of mixed media. I've either scanned or photographed so that I have a digital file of that image. And in Photoshop, I've combined them into a sort of layered composite sandwich, a bit like an animator works where you can make a stack of images and pair away the backgrounds to try and meld them together. So there's been quite a challenge to make drawn images work with painted images and one, you know, the, and getting the light or the colours then adequate. So the, all, all the images, most of them, this is an exception, but most of them have uh, com combinations of drawings and artwork of mine that have been configured digitally and into a new composite image and then they've been printed on perspex to suit the light boxes. Um, this is an exception, that's a, a detail from a big canvas I did about all the edible species that occur behind the dunes um, in an area called Walmadam which we've spent a great deal of time in the last five years trying to fight to protect a place called Walmart and on Price's Point, which is up on this northwest Kimberley coast, because they had great plans for um, a gas refinery to go in these dunes. So a lot of these images, I've been spurred to make them to try and show people what's there and what's at stake in the face of losing it. So that's been a lot of my motivation. Um, and I've been spending a lot of time in Brown as a result to try and help the family I live with um, argue their case for the cultural heritage being respected and, and protected. These little light boxes in the front window, these are also about the six seasons. They, they also relate in the same order as the ones on the wall. Um, the first one with the lizard and the moths, that's when all the it's after the wet season when all the grass is very long and um, all the grasses are seeding. There's lots of insects around, so all the seed and insect eating birds are going mental. But, and the reptiles are to be feeding up. Um, after the wet, quite a lot of the plants are fruiting too, having had the immersion um, from the rains. These boxes are all made in layers, so instead of merging them into a sandwich on one surface, um, I've sort of maintained the, the separate components more on a on a split level to give you a sense of more of a sense of the actual trying to create more of a sense spatial sense of the of the place, I guess. Um, but yeah, they're all thematically about each of the six seasons in Broome. Um, there's a, you know, there was a, you know, I've got a descriptive sheet about what happens at different times of year, and they're, they're, the descriptions are also on the sides of the boxes here if you're interested. Um, you may recognise some of the drawings in the diary to my boxes, I'm not sure if any of them have made it. Oh yeah, the couple, the couple shells. This is the original drawing that, um, in the second last box that made it into that light box. But it's just to give you a sense of my when I do the drawings originally. It's more from my memory trying to uh, try and do little realistic drawings of things and write notes, all sorts of notes, just for my own mental sense of keeping it in my head and. Um, they're never really done with an eye to being a polished piece of art. It's more a journalistic record. It's why I do the art in the first place. But um, 
want to ask, have you done any of this sort of work down here with the... I have. The well, 